Well, all right. I took all my jabs at Pastor for, during first service, so uh, this time, I guess, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I wanted to just take a moment um, and express how thankful I am for my pastor because I honestly, I mean, if you would have asked me six months ago if I could have taught a lesson uh, in big service, as we call it back in Switch, I would have said, nah, not a chance. But, uh, but I just the time that I've spent with Pastor and uh, how much, you know, he's kind of pointed me in the right direction and in my relationship with God and my walk with God and just helped lead this church um, and in the process leading me down the path he has, it's just been it's been very life-changing, I would say, and it's changed my heart in a lot of ways, and, and a lot of that uh, is due to him and, you know, his obedience to God and um, his willingness to, to make decisions that need to be made and, and willingness to do what needs to be done, and he always does everything out of a heart for this church and out of a heart for you. So, as he said the same thing about me, I will say it is because of the leadership I have received from him, um, and I just wanted to say thank you, all right? I'm trying to throw a curveball at him because last time, I, last service, I, I was throwing strikes right at him. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, well, when Pastor asked me to talk uh, today, um, knowing that it is the week after Thanksgiving, uh, we decided uh, that gratefulness would be a good topic. Um, when I first told him I had a lot to say about gratefulness, uh, I didn't realize how much I had to say, so I really had to, you know, whittle things down and, and try to figure out better ways to say it. Um, so anyway, as I put this message together, uh, I kind of got this mindset of, you know, around Thanksgiving, it seems like everyone's thinking about Christmas already. And uh, I always joke with my wife because she, she had our Christmas tree up like three weeks ago, and it was whatever. I came home from work. It was done. I'm like, well, at least I didn't have to do anything. She carried it in herself. We had, so uh, we bought a new house, got high ceilings in it. And so we have a 10 foot tall Christmas tree. And that little girl got that whole tree in there out of the bag by herself. And I, uh, I'm the one that put it in the house. And I thought, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that you did that. She's been sandbagging me all this time, <laughs> making me <laughs> move the furniture. Meanwhile, Mighty Mouse there. So anyway, <laughs> so our trees have been up and we got lights everywhere. So uh, Friday after Thanksgiving, as I, that I'm adamant, has to wait till after Thanksgiving. I took a break from studying and went and bought some lights, put them up on the outside of the house, and she was all pumped because she got to go out on the balcony of our house up on the roof, and she's all, you know, she's up there and take my picture and all that, and so we did that. It's on Instagram if you want to see it, but anyway, um, as a lot of us think about Christmas around this time and start gearing our mind towards that, I started thinking about this uh, scenario that I think happens in just about every family. Um, you know, you gather with, you know, extended family and everything, and, and you're, you start opening presents with the cousins and the nieces and nephews and, and everything, and, and you always got that one kid, okay? You always got that one kid that is, you can tell the presents start getting passed out, and they're like counting other kids' presents, and then looking at counting theirs, and they're like, oh, and you can tell the disappointment on their face before they ever start opening the presents, and then they start opening the presents, and, and sometimes it gets verbal, where they're verbally um, expressing their disgust with their gifts and their unappreciation, and... Uh, and it just, it gets to that point where um, sometimes the parents got to pull them out in the hallway and, and, you know, chew them out or smack their butt or what, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm not judging your parenting. But, um, but it always happens. And I always have this hope that it's not my kid and it's one of my sisters. Okay? <laughs> so, because if it's one of my sisters, I get to get in the car afterwards and think, can, Emily, can you believe that, you know? <laughs> But when it's ours, it's like, oh, we're the failures of the parenting game this year. But so anyway, if you're a parent, and I guarantee you it's happened to you at some point where your kid has let something slip out of their mouth while they're opening presents. A couple years ago, Zeke opened a present, and, and I still remember it because it's one of those, I don't know why it emotionally scars you as a parent when, you're, when your kid expresses, like, disgust in a present. But he opens it, and he's like, ah, I already have this. <laughs> oh, great. We're the parents this time. But anyway but that happens. And I think we're all, we've all been there. We, we all have that. And I don't know why, but it takes that happening 
for us to remember that we got to give the big talk before we go open presents in front of people. So now every year, um, before we open presents or before birthdays or whatever, you got to have the talk. You you get to, before you get out of the car, you lock the doors. Hey, you, if you even let anything slip, you are thankful, you are happy, you give them hugs, you give them kisses, and you say thank you, okay? So we do that, don't we? We do. It's, that's the way it works. And you, when, it, when it's your kid, you, you want to crawl under the table. Like, it's embarrassing. So I think that is a good way of me thinking about expressing gratitude and choosing to be grateful in the fact that we're telling our kids, hey, be thankful that what you got, you got. Be thankful that someone cared about you enough to go buy you a gift, and this is what you got. Be thankful. So we're telling our kids to do that, and all the while, as adults, we, get, we grow older, and maybe our circumstances may change, and it's not presents that we're thinking about, but maybe it's life events that happen, and, um, you know, I think a lot of the things, the first thing that comes to my mind right now is not something that's in my notes, but uh, I don't know if, but, like, you think you'd be further along than you would in life. Maybe you thought you'd be married by now, and you're not. Maybe you thought you'd have kids by now, but you don't, and it hasn't happened yet. And all these things that we can think about, we, we look at our neighbors, we look at people on Facebook, at their highlight reels, and, and we start thinking like, wow, like, God, what, where are you in my stuff? Why, why am I not being blessed like this, like they are? Or, you know, or the circumstances of, Oh, there's just, there's so many negative things that are happening in my life. Why, God? Like, why is, why is all this so negative? Why, why can't good things happen to me? And I think we can all get that way, okay? I think we all get that way where we start focusing on the negative. And my point in the story originally is, is the fact that that's human nature. That's our human nature to, to look, at the neg- look at the negative all the time, it seems like, you know? So, so we have all these negative things that we look at, and maybe we've dreamed for something bigger and, and thought we'd be in a different place in our life, and, and we were going to go do big, big things, and yet here we are, you know, still in our hometown or, or whatever the case may be. We're just not as far along in our career. We don't make as much money as we thought we'd make or whatever the case may be, but, but we, we had dreams or we thought we'd be the circumstances would be different, or, you know, maybe it's a fam- maybe it's a relationship with a family member. We, you know, we're struggling with that. It's, you know, Thanksgiving time is one of those times where you get together with your family and, and things are said, you know, opinions are voiced when you're stuck in a house with someone for 10 hours, and, uh, and divides happen, and sometimes divides happen long before that, and it's years before people talk to each other and forgive each other. There's all those things, but we can focus on that negative. And uh, so I have, I have another um, example. I didn't think about this until this morning when I was reading through my notes one last time, but a good example I have of uh, just that focusing on the negative. I think a lot of times something big happens or, or what we perceive as big and our field of vision narrows, okay? So we, get, we, we lose sight of all the good things around us and our field of vision narrows on circumstances. And the example that came to my mind comes from when I was in high school. And um, I, may, I may seem like I have game, but I don't. And I uh, got dumped a couple times when I was in high school. I joked for service. I said, you know, like, I was always the dump E. I was never the dump er. You know, I never had the game. My wife has always been a dump er. And uh, so I, those two people always end up together. I don't know why. You got a dumper and a dumpy. I was the dumpy. And uh, anyway, but when you get dumped and you're in high school, the way it feels is that your life is over. There is nothing good in the world, and there's no reason to even get out of the house. There's no reason to get out of bed. There's nothing good that could possibly happen today. I have nothing good in my life because so-and-so dumped me, okay? And and as a parent, you know, I think you grow up and you start telling your kids, like, hey, life goes on. There's, there's other fish in the sea. This world's a big world. But it doesn't really matter what you say as a parent. I remember my mom trying to tell me all that stuff. And I'm like, no, mom, that's where you're wrong. She's the one. She's the one, mom, okay? I remember saying that. So <laughs> then, 
Luckily, I didn't have to go through too much of that. I think God kind of thought, okay, I've tortured him enough. Let's give him somebody that he's going to stick with. I met, my, I met my wife my senior year of high school, and we've been together ever since. Well, we did break up for a little bit. She broke my heart for about six months and then came crawling back. But besides the point, <laughs> crawling back, it was. She begged. Uh, anyway, and uh, so I wasn't much of a player. I didn't play hard to get. I'm like, yep, that sounds good, you know. But... <laughs> Because I knew she was the one. Well, anyway, but we, what, when I was going through that in high school, I came, became so hyper-focused on the negative and that one circumstance, the life-altering circumstance, that I lost sight of everything good that was happening in my life, everything good around me, um, everything that God had given me, who God was. I mean, you lose sight of so much when you're focused on the negative. And so... It's vital that we become uh, more aware of the good around us, and it's vital that we become more thankful for the things that we have. That's what God wants for us, okay? God doesn't want us to ride these roller coasters of emotion. God wants us to, um, to stay, to keep his peace, to stay steady in him, okay? So I have a, a verse here, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, I want to read to you. Be thankful in all circumstances, It's not up there yet, but for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in all circumstances. So a couple things, the very first two words are be thankful. If the first two words say be thankful, that means that thankfulness is a choice. We choose to be thankful. Um, God isn't saying that he gives us thankfulness. He says choose, be thankful, like choose to be thankful, okay? And then it says in all circumstances. Okay, well, how do you, how do you, Remain thankful in all circumstances. There's some circumstances that are really hard to remain thankful in, okay? And I don't think, you know, that it necessarily means don't feel sad about a circumstance or, you know, circumstances aren't going to affect your feelings. But what they do, what I think you can do is you can control how you react to your feelings. And I think you can choose to be thankful for a lot of different things and remind yourself of a lot of things in life that you can be thankful for at all times, um, And you don't have to focus on the negative all the time. I think that's what that means, in my opinion. Well, I have a quick story for you guys. Um, Somebody who has really uh, done a lot in my life in a short period of time, and by just by being who he is, okay? So recently I started going to the gym. I feel like every time I say that I have to preface that it's recent, okay? (laughs) I don't have the results yet, but they're coming, I promise. But, um, But I started going to the gym. And there's a guy in there, and he, uh, he's about 40-ish, I'd say, ish. I don't know exactly how old he is. Um, but when he was 18, he got in a car wreck, and he, and he became paralyzed, okay? And he walked, he, well, he doesn't walk, and he rolls into the gym every single week, and he's like, he's pumped to be there. He's pumped to see you. He makes you feel like... You're the only one in the gym. He brightens up the gym when he walks in. He's so excited to see you. And you can tell, and I know he's a Christian. We've had conversations about this. His family actually uh, runs a church here in town. And he, man, he makes such a difference in whatever room he's in, every, every place that he's in. He makes a difference. And, you know, I go to work. And I, I go to the gym after work. So I go to work, and I, and I go through all this stuff at work, okay, whatever it may be, and I can get real mopey. I think we can all get real mopey about our day and have a bad day and think about things in a negative light or, you know, something bad happened. We can think negatively. And so I walk in, and, you, and you know, I kind of can walk in with that negative mindset, of just gr- bah humbug or what a grumbling. And you walk in, and I see him uh, a few months back. He started really focusing on building up his stamina to stand, okay? And so you walk in, and he's got this rack set up that he he pulls himself up on, and he can pull himself up, and he kind of holds himself up with his arms, and he started to, you know, utilize his legs, and he's building strength in his legs, and he can stand for a little bit longer and sit back down, and he'll stand up for a little longer, sit down. Well, he's building that up, okay? So I have gotten to witness him build build up his ability to stand for greater and greater periods of time. Okay, this guy is, he thanks God every day that he even has the ability to do that. 
he's already thanking God for the ability, giving him the ability to walk again. Okay, he's, he's, he's there. He's ready. Well, what that does, he has that attitude of gratitude. He has that um, excitement that he's going to walk again. And he has this uh, positive attitude and outlook, even though he's in a wheelchair and, you know, he, he can't currently walk. But he's not letting that stop him, and he's not letting that take his, he's not letting that take his happiness. And so it makes me think when I walk in, you want to talk about, like, getting hit with a guilt trip immediately of, like, okay, here I am complaining about whatever it is I'm complaining about, which pales in comparison to what he's got going on in his circumstances and I'm moping around, and he's found a way to be happy no matter what, okay? Now, if you, I mean, you want to talk about just a lesson in the way he lives his life right there. Oh, my goodness. So, anyway, we can all get there. We can all get to where we're, we're letting our negative attitude run our lives, and yet here he is with his circumstances, and he's not. He's not letting that happen. And he's learned the lesson, I think, probably more than most of us will ever learn that lesson. But, uh, anyway... The fact of the matter is he chooses to be thankful. And that's what God wants from us, be thankful in all circumstances. So I thought this was an interesting thing, but I Googled, um, I Googled, you know, how many times does the Bible talk about being thankful or giving thanks? A lot of times it seems like preachers do that. So I thought, well, if everybody else does it, I might as well too. And it talks about it 71 times in the New Testament. 71 times it says give thanks or be thankful or something to that effect. 71 times, that's a lot of times to talk about being thankful. How many of you guys know that probably means it's kind of important, okay? But why? So why, why, why is that important? Why is gratitude important? So I put together a few points as far as why gratitude's important. I don't think that it's limited to this, but this is what um, God gave me to say, so I'm gonna, I wanna walk through these. And the first thing is, is gratitude changes our perspective, okay? Gratitude changes our perspective. So as I was putting this, um, this message together, I was listening to a few different messages uh, on gratitude, and I heard one of the, one of the pastors that taught this message uh, talked about this, and I was absolutely floored by it. I could not believe that this was the case, so I Googled it, and it turns out that this is a widely known thing. But did you know that in the Olympics... Someone who wins a bronze medal is statistically happier with their results than someone who wins a silver medal. I thought, there's no way. Why, how is that the case? You know, how, how is someone that won a bronze medal statistically happier than someone who won silver? And then I, then I Googled it and read why, and it made all the sense in the world to me. And it all had to do with perspective. The person who wins the bronze medal is so excited to be on the podium. They're so thankful. They're so, yeah, I made it, uh, that, that that's their focus. Whereas the person who wins silver is so focused on the fact that they were so close to gold and they didn't get it, that, that that's their focus. Okay, if that doesn't tell you everything you know, need to know about perspective, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what does. So not to say that someone should just take their silver shut up and be grateful. I mean, they should probably, but I understand you work, you put a lot of effort in if you're in the Olympics. Uh, but what, what's crazy is, is the fact that our perspective controls so much of our attitude. So I think that the perspective, uh, that story tells us a few things. I think it tells you that, you know, when you have a bad perspective and you have you're looking through that negative lens, okay? Your, your focus is on all the negative things and you're forgetting what the positives actually are. And man, is that, is that perspective thing big because all it takes is changing those glasses that you're looking through, changing the color of the lens or whatever you wanna say figuratively, but you start looking at things in a perspective of a positive light and, a, and using gratitude in that, in that thankful light and looking at the things that you get to be thankful for and thank you, God, that you've done this in my life. Thank you, God, that here, I, you know, all these things that I have to be thankful for. When you focus on that, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world in our lives. And we, we are so much happier, just like that, you know, that uh, statistic shows. We can be happier with a different perspective. So, Number two, 
Gratitude brings us God's peace. Gratitude brings us God's peace. So I was, as I was talking about earlier, you know, we all have these circumstances that arise in our lives, and we can focus so much, hyper-focus on our circumstances that we start riding the waves, the ebbs and flows of life. Sometimes good things are happening, and we have no reason to be upset. Sometimes the world comes crashing down, and it wrecks our world. And what's the first thing that happens? We lose our peace. We lose our peace. We lose, you know, we get uh, anxious. We get uh, fearful. We get anxiety and it's, oh, hopelessness and all that stuff. Well, what we're doing is we're, we're riding, we're riding our circumstances and we're letting those judge how we're feeling and judge how we react rather than, rather than focusing on the positives and focusing on God, really. Because that's what it's all about is God's peace. So let me read this to you, Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Let the peace that God gives you gives control your thinking. It is for peace that you were chosen to be together in one body. And always be thankful. Let the teaching of Christ live inside you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and counsel each other. Sing psalms, hymns, and uh, spiritual songs, and thankfulness in your hearts to God. Everything you say and everything you do should be done for Jesus your Lord. And in all that, give thanks for God the Father through Jesus. God's a loving and gracious God. Because the fact of the matter is, he doesn't want us to just live our life, struggle through life, claw our way through life, and go to heaven. No, God's saying, no, I want to give you peace, and I want to give you the ability to to live your life and and be happy through life and enjoy your life and and live a successful life and and one of purpose and passion, okay? But you got to have his peace. And, you know, one thing I didn't point out in first service uh, is that, you know, it talks about here, everything you say, everything you do should be done for Jesus your Lord, okay? So a lot of that focus needs to be on God. I actually talked last week in Lafayette about prioritizing God in our lives. When, we, when our focus is not on, you know, um, just having peace for ourselves and, and that selfish mindset, but we're focused on God and we put our focus on him and, and we're, we're trying to grow in our relationship, God's giving us his peace just by doing that. But, but we, wanna have, we wanna have peace that's rooted in Christ, And the way we do that is through gratitude. It's through being thankful, okay? So being thankful gives us God's peace because we start to focus on all the positives and not the negatives. So just think, if we had God's peace in our lives and and our world came crashing down, what would that look like? I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know that most of us in here could even fathom it because... We don't know. We don't know what that's like. And it's really hard to fathom what it might be like to have peace through through a crazy experience because we've never done it. And so just think what it would be, you know, what it would be like to go through something and just it doesn't really affect you like it used to. It's you can remain happy. You can keep your happiness about you. You can keep your peace. Though You don't freak out because you got God on your side and you remember that. Number three, gratitude is a powerful weapon. How many of you guys in here struggle with your feelings even though you try not to? Even though you purpose to be positive, somehow fear, anxiety, hopelessness, you know, um, just that depression that can come along where we're just, we're so focused on our circumstances once again that we lose sight of that. But gratitude is a powerful weapon. Let me read a verse. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So when when we're sitting there and we're looking at all the evidence in our life around us, when circumstances arise that just aren't ideal or, or circumstances that just really wreck your world, we look around and, and I think our mind, what our mind does is it starts showing us all these negative things happening and it, and it shows us the evidence that God's not working. God's not in this. 
How could God be in this? There, there's no way. God's not around or he wouldn't have let this happen. You know, but when we use God and we use his word, we have power. And we can do this by being grateful. And let me explain. When we're grateful, when we train our minds to think grateful thoughts, when we, when we train our minds to be thankful, what we're doing is we're starting to train our mind, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, but, but it, it changes the lens we look through. It changes the perspective, like I talked about earlier. That's what it does. And what ends up happening is we stop looking so much at the evidence around us, and we focus on the fact that no, no, no. God is who he says he is. His word says that I can take captive every thought I have and make it obedient to God. Made it, make it obedient to what he says about me. That's, that's so huge. You know, the fact that, that we have power over our thoughts. That alone. We have power over our thoughts. Okay? God gives us power over our thoughts. But they've got to be aligned in him. So, this brings me to how. Okay? So, we've learned we, we should probably have gratitude. It's probably a good thing to have gratitude. We could live a lot better of a life with gratitude. Our life would be so much better, but how, okay? Um, and I like to give how-tos, okay? I love how-tos because um, I'm just not as smooth as Pastor Archie is, and when he tells me to do stuff, usually I follow up uh, with a question of how, and how would you like me to do that? Because to be honest with you, I'm not so confident in my skills and abilities. So let me give some points as far as how. So I have a whole second set of points. You thought we were almost done, but we're not. Here we are. How do we develop gratitude? Okay? How do we develop gratitude? So number one, train your brain. So I heard a uh, message from... Uh, actually, it's Craig Rochelle. I'll just tell you who it is. So if you want to look it up, I think it's Winning the War in Your Mind. He actually wrote a book on it, uh, but he did a sermon series called Winning the War in Your Mind. But he talks a lot about the biology behind it. I'm not smart enough to be able to just reiterate all that to you, um, but I do remember the analogy, and I think the analogy is very easy to think about and understand and he says, you know, imagine your brain is like just a grassy meadow, okay, like four, three, four foot tall um, grass, and, and, you know, you've got to walk through that. That's a thought process. Walking through that meadow is a thought process. And, you know, if you're trying to think a thought process for the first time, those, that grass is all entangled, ask a hunter that's been out deer hunting, they can tell you this. You're tripping, you're tripping over everything. It's hard to get through it. It's hard to fight through all the brush and everything. It's hard to get through all that. But if you want to go back through right after, you know, you've blazed a little bit of a trail, and then you think that thought again, and you go through it again, and, and, and you start blazing a trail. Well, the more you think that thought process, the more times you pass through that path, it starts to wear down, and it starts to widen out. And it starts to become easier to walk through. And you walk through it enough, and next thing you know, you've got this path that you can walk through where things aren't even hitting you. They're not even touching you. And see, the problem is, is that our brain always takes the path of least resistance. And a lot of us, over our lifetimes, have developed a, not only just a worn path, but some of us have paved a highway of negative thoughts, okay? Okay. We have made it really easy for our mind to walk down that highway of negative thoughts. We've paved the path. And the problem with that is, is our brain is going to always naturally go down the easy path. Just like we would if we walked up to a grassy area. I'm not going to walk through the grass when there's a path right there. I'm going to go walk down the path. That makes sense, right? Okay. Our brain works the exact same way. So we have to train our brain. We have to Put in effort to train our brain. How do we do that? Like, okay, I told you how. Train your brain. Okay, well, how do you train your brain? Here we go. All right. We train our brain by doing things like um, maybe you start out making lists of things you're thankful for, and then you read them to yourself every day. Maybe you start journaling or, you know, things that I feel super cheesy doing, okay? Am I right? Like, that's, it feels cheesy to do that sometimes. I know some people um, 
keep journals and, and uh, do diaries and things like that. And I think that's so cool. But when I try to do it in my own, my own life by myself, I just feel super cheesy. But the fact of the matter is, is that it hurts and it's painful because it's not something that I'm used to doing. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be, it should be easy to, to do that, but it's not. So we have to go through some discomfort to get there. Um, another thing you can do is start setting, start set a set a timer in your phone or alarm to go off every day or reminders on your calendar or something of like, hey, be thankful. Remind, remember to be thankful. You know, you have to set up things to where you're not going to naturally think of it. You get busy in your day, bad stuff starts happening, and you get so um, you get so. It, whatever, I'm trying to think of, enthralled, is that a word? I don't know. Anyway, but you get so into trying to, trying to deal with that stuff that you lose sight of the fact that you're thankful, and then you get to the end of the day, and you're bah humbug, and you're not thankful about anything because your brain's so used to thinking those negative thoughts that you, you haven't trained your brain at all. So uh, I, this popped into my brain earlier. I'm sure I've heard it before because things don't usually come to my brain naturally. <laughs> usually I've heard it and it just comes out in the middle of something. But I talked about, you know, it's kind of like bowling. We need to set up bumpers because we're not good at bowling yet. We're not good at thinking those thoughts. So set, set some bumpers up to keep you in the lane. So another thing is utilize somebody that's really close to you to help hold you accountable to thinking good thoughts. So when negativity starts coming out and when you're focusing on the negative things, people that are close to you know that. They they can see it. It comes out in your attitude. It comes out in what your words say. It comes out in all that stuff. So give somebody permission and let them, give them permission. Let them hold you accountable and say, hey man, uh, I really think you're I really think you're kind of getting negative and I kind of think you're, you're losing sight of who God is in your life and, and you're losing sight of all the things around you that you have to be thankful for. You're, you're really focusing on the bads here. Give them, give them the opportunity to do that. Hold you accountable. And you know what? You're right. So Emily and I, a couple weeks ago, I had a mental breakdown big time. She did too, so don't just don't look, think badly about me. She did too. Um, but uh, I had mine first, so I'll give her the credit. Um, it just had a lot going on, preparing for messages at church, believe it or not, <laughs> stressed out about it, and just thinking, you know, oh, I got to get this done, plus I, you know, ripped the wall out of our house, and we got family coming over, and uh, just got so overwhelmed by life in general, work's crazy, everything's crazy, oh my goodness, how am I going to get it all done, and, and Emily's like, hey, have you spent time with God, like, have you prayed? <sighs> no, I haven't, and I went upstairs, and I just prayed. I read my Bible a little bit, did a, did a Bible study on the Bible app, and, and within 15 minutes, it took 15 minutes, people, for me to change my view, and it's like all of a sudden, the stuff that was such a big deal that I was freaking out about, I realized it's not a big deal. Like, it's gonna, I can do that in 10 minutes, I can do that in an hour, and that, I'll figure it out. I don't know, but it'll happen. And I wasn't worried about it anymore. I wasn't anxious about it. Well, that's what we need in our lives. We need people to, to say, hey, have you spent time with God? I mean, because let's be honest with ourselves. If we are real honest, when life starts getting busy and we start getting stressed out, what's the first thing that we forget to start doing? Spending time with God. It just... It's just, I don't know why we do that because that's the one thing we need. It's kind of like when life gets tough, some of us, we stop coming to church because we're so busy. We're so busy. We, we stop coming to church and we get so overwhelmed and things, and we freak out. Well, that's the, church is the one thing that we should be doing. That's the one thing that does help us and we cut off the thing that helps us. Why? Why do we do that? I don't know, but not, don't, I guess. Use the tools. God gives us church family. God gives us people around us. Use those tools to to keep yourself in the lane, okay? Number two, practice generosity. That could be money. That could be serving. That could be your time. That could be your attitude with your spouse. That could be so many things, but be generous. Be generous because generosity is you taking the focus off of yourself and it's putting it on somebody else. It's taking the focus off of yourself and putting your focus on serving other people by, you know, just helping other people. And God uses that in a lot of ways, a lot of ways. And if I can 
be really honest with you, this is the main thing that God's used to change my life between being generous by just our tithe and our offering. Uh, my wife and I started tithing and offering. I've talked about this before, but, but what it did, I was so stingy with my money. I was so selfish with my money. And I see, I'm, I guess I'm not fixed because I keep saying my money, but uh, <laughs> me and my wife's and God's that he gave us uh, is the proper thing, I think. But uh, anyway, I was so stingy with it that I didn't want to give it. I didn't want to, because we got to keep it. We're, we're in a pickle here. Well, I started tithing and we just decided we were going to tithe. And to be, if I'm being real honest, you know, I keep, I kept hearing pastors say like you tithe and it pressed down, shaken together, you know, your cup runneth over back at you. Well, so I'm like, hey, we'll start tithing and that'll give us out of our money bind. Well, uh, so I put God to the test, okay? But I did it with the wrong heart at first, but I started learning and my heart started changing. And I believe that, you know, God blessed me in a lot of different ways. And some of it was financial, but some of it wasn't. Some of it was my heart change. Some of it, I started viewing things differently and changed a lot of ways that I, and realizing the unhealthiness that I, the unhealthy relationship that I had with my money. Well, serving worked the same way here at church. I started serving because, if I'm being honest, uh, the whole, my whole family served, uh, that my in-laws did, and, and I was just like, well, this is what I got to do to be part of the family, I guess. But what I started learning through that process is that God changed my view of people. He changed my heart is what he did. I developed a heart for people and loving people and wanting to see people succeed and wanting to help people become better. And that's where my focus shifted. God changed my heart through that, okay? And he changed my heart and made me so, I get so happy and I have such passion for that now that I never used to have. So when, you know, when we stop and we think, you know, like, oh, church is all about our money. Church just wants us to come and work because they need help. And, you know, no, we'll, we'll, like the church is going to find the help. God's going to provide the help is what's going to happen. Church isn't going to find it. God will provide it. God will provide the money. But God needs you and your heart. God's after your heart. So the church is here, and we give opportunities to serve. We give opportunities to give because we know that that is the biggest tool that God uses for your heart, okay? So take that as you will. Um, I did have a couple verses that I forgot to read because I got in uh, my soapbox. Luke 6.38, give, and it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be given back to you. Acts 20, 35, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we serve others, when we use our generosity in all the different ways, God changes our hearts, okay? God changes our hearts. So, number three, remember who God is and, that all, and all that he's done for us. James 1, 17 says, every good thing comes from God. Every perfect gift is from him. These good gifts come down from the Father who made all the lights in the sky. But God never changes like the shadows from those lights. He's always the same. God's always the same. He's always here. He's always here for you. He doesn't want to see you struggle. God wants to see you succeed God wants you to grow in, his relation, in your relationship with him. He wants to change your heart. He wants to change your life because he loves you. He also, because he loves you, wants to show you passion that you, can, that you can use the gifts and abilities that he's given you and use those and become so passionate that you're changing other people's lives in the process. So not only is he changing your life, he's changing other people's lives too. I mean, how awesome is that, that God, God loves us so much that that he has a will for our lives. He has a plan for us. James 1, 2 through 5 says, it's earlier on in the chapter here. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind come your, comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That's something right there, isn't it? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask your generous God, and he'll give it to you. 
he will not rebuke you for asking. When we remember who God is in our lives, when we learn who God is, when it comes, becomes part of us, because that's what happens when we, the more we study our Bibles and the, and the more we grow in our relationship, the more that gets inside of us and that's just who we become because God changes our hearts through a lot of that. That's what happens is, is we can start to consider things joy that we wouldn't have found as joyful. We, can, we have these circumstances that arise that we can look at and say, hmm, well, I wonder what God's trying to teach me through this. Well, you know what? I'm gonna rely on him and let him, let him teach me. Let him teach me. Let's consider it joy, okay? Now, sometimes that may not happen immediately. You know, sometimes it may take us a little bit of feelings to get to that, um, to get to that mindset, but we can get to that mindset. We can get to that mindset of, you know, God's got something big for me in this. I know it. I know he does because God works together for our good at all times. That's who he is. He's not changing. He doesn't change. He doesn't treat me differently than somebody else. He loves us all the same, and he loves us. He loves us greatly. So God loves us. And when we remember that, we can always have something to be thankful for. Always. And I think that it's hard to end this without really reminding you of what God has really, really done for all of us. We don't have to worry about where we're gonna go when we die. God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins and he rose again. And now because of that, that sacrifice that God sent for us, we're able to live eternal life in heaven when we die. So everything here on earth, no matter how bad your circumstances are, they could be the absolute worst. We can, we can always be thankful for the fact that, you know, we're going somewhere where there's no pain, no suffering, you know, we have all that. So we can always be thankful for that. And I think when we can really, really, really wrap our heads around the fact that we've been set free from all of our sin and we're forgive, forgiven and God's grace is sufficient, we can always, always, always have something to be thankful for. So as I'm kind of wrapping this up, I, I just encourage you to use Use the tools around us that God gives us. Use those things um, that he puts in our lives. I, th I think that, you know, God can work miracles. I, I don't, I know he can. But I also think sometimes he's like, hey, dummy, like I put stuff, I put people in your life. I've given you the ability to get help. I've, I've given you the ability to do a bunch of things for yourself. And, and I want you to use those things too. I mean, I don't want to always just have to fix it for you. I've Fix it. I, I've given you the ability to do it. So, so we have to focus on, on God, and we want to we grow in his relationship. We want to use the power of gratitude in our lives. God gave us gratitude and, and tells us to be thankful because he knows what it can do in our lives. And, I mean, when we realize that and we, and we start to grow in our gratitude, I think there's, you know, it's one of those, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm, am I there yet? No, but I'm a lot further than I used to be. yes. I've, I've learned a lot, and I've learned that, you know, when you start having that mindset and I start choosing to be thankful, I start to, I start to choose to be thankful, and my heart changes, and, and my heart is constantly changing and growing and growing and growing, and my relationship with God's growing, and it's, it's changed my life in a lot of ways, and I know we've talked about a lot of that, but how awesome would it be to go through all circumstances in life, no matter what happens, and keep our peace, keep God's peace?